Okay, here we are in the driver's seat. Yeah. Yeah, welcome back, parents. Um, for those of you that this is your first time in the driver's seat with us, um, this is a companion episode to Mini Evangelism where we take the story that was discussed in the previous episode and we talk about it without our kids in the car. That's it. Yep, we talk about, you know, how we learned about it as children, what it looks like for us as adults, because maybe we haven't heard this story in decades. Yeah, and we also talk about um, what it's like to talk to kids about stories like this. Yes. Yeah. So, Cain and Abel. Yes. Pastor Drew, how were you taught Cain and Abel? Uh, not much. I don't, I think... Uh, because it includes like sibling rivalry that ends in murder, mm -hmm. I think we often um, leave it out. I noticed in one of the children's Bibles we use at the church, if the story's not even in there, a uh, lot of a lot of children's Bibles don't include this yeah. story in there. Yeah, and I think uh, so. I don't. I don't know that I had much interaction with it at all. It wasn't until I went to seminary that we read this story, and my professor pointed out that like the story's called Cain and Abel but it's actually a story about Cain and God. Mm. And, uh, and so that's when I kind of fell in love with the story. Um, and now I think it's really good and really important. And I think children can handle it. That's my opinion. I think like my kids watch plenty of TV and have plenty of stories where somebody dies. I don't think that personally, I don't necessarily feel like I need to protect them from a story about a murder. Uh, but I, I get that some folks would just kind of rather avoid it. Right. Um, but with my kids, uh, talking about hating your sibling is actually probably a good thing for them to have some experience with. Because mm -hmm. it's also a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. about you? How did you inherit the story? Did, was there another VHS tape? There was not a VHS tape for okay. this one. But I did learn it from an early age. My The church I grew up in was like, the Bible is for everybody. And, you're and gonna, the whole Bible is for everybody. The whole Bible. And so even if, even if it's nasty, even if there's murder, <laughs> even if it's dark, you're going to learn about it. Yeah. And so... Uh, we and were... how did that go for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can ask my therapist. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't think anything differently yeah. um, until I had a kid and um, we got a bunch of children's Bibles because um, both come from like Christian families. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. just we have so many children's Bibles. Yeah, we do too. And every, there was one, I was reading the story of David and Goliath, which is a different story that involves a murder. Yes. And um, in, the, in the story, it says... David hit Goliath of the rock and Goliath never bothered the people again. Oh. <laughs> Whereas when I was in Sunday school, it's like, oh, he cut off his head. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> it's all this stuff. So Cain and Abel, we, we talked about it, that um, Cain and Abel, they each presented an offering to God and God liked Abel's more than Cain's. I remember this picture. It was like a, a picture hanging up in my Sunday school class. And both of them are kneeling before their offerings. And Cain has this like altar built with all of these like fruits and vegetables. And um, I mean, just stuff that should not be growing in the same region, but it was all there. And then um, Abel is sitting in front of his altar and there's a dead animal on it. And Abel's offering is on fire and Cain's offering is not. And Cain is like very disappointed. Mm. And so I always thought that God showed his favor by sending fire. And then I mm. read the Bible and I was like, oh, that's not in that's there not at all. <laughs> There's always, yeah. This, and this story is very, actually, it's very short. So yeah. any details we have, have been interpreted or imagined. Exactly. So always a good reminder to go back and read the original text. Um, even if it's translation and you don't read Hebrew, because I don't really read Hebrew. So, uh, but see what's actually in the Bible. You don't really read it. No. I, <laughs> just just occasionally. You're just a casual Hebrew I, reader. I, I, yeah. I can't record myself saying that I'm a Hebrew scholar. I am not. Yes. Yeah. So I had that. And then we were told that Cain got mad. And then he killed his brother. That was another picture in some ch some Bible or some poster. I don't know. I just, it just burned in my brain of him. Abel is like on the ground. And mm -hmm. Cain is holding like a rock axe. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. he's standing over him. Um, and then, yeah. And then God placed a mark on Cain's head and sent him away. And part of what the I'm end. curious about is <laughs> in the story you inherited, does is there a moral of the story or is it just a story? It's just a story. The, I think, the, and I think that's actually kind of good. Well, the moral of the story is um, 
don't don't skimp out on what you give God, mm-hmm. and don't kill somebody. Mm-hmm. And then if you do kill somebody, you're sent out of God's presence. Yeah. And I think that's when you and I were kind of talking before we started recording. I I told you I. I got beef with this story because it never had a moral. It never had a lesson. It was just like more bad things happening to Adam and Eve and this very like vengeful God, I guess. Yeah. Who's like showing favoritism and then getting mad that someone is upset about him showing favoritism. Yeah. Um, But then the more I actually read in the Bible and then talking to Hannah, talking to a child (laughs) about it and then talking to you about it. Like I'm starting to see it through a different lens Yeah, and it's taking on it it, in the last 48 hours. It's just taken on a lot more meaning. Yeah. I think it's fascinating the degree to which we, uh, we have an instinct to kind of like stick up for Cain. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) What, like, what do you think that's about? I mean, I, so we talked about this on the mini evangelism episode. I am a firstborn. Yeah. And so I think we got to stick together. <laughs> the firstborn is just the high achieving firstborn. Yeah. And, um, you know what? He didn't do anything. Like there were no, as far as we know, there were no rules about what you could and couldn't offer. Yeah. So like he didn't make yeah. a mistake. So you know? <laughs> you, there, there are rules later. There are. And so those rules can be read into the story that, like, by the law set, set given to Moses, like, Abel's offering was a qualitatively better offering. Yes. So for early Jewish readers or hearers, like, that part kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and skimping on your offering has been a, accusation, a common accusation throughout Jewish and Christian history. Yes. Uh, h- however, I think, I'm, I'm not so sure that that's, really the point and i think it's also fair to like leave some room for the exact feelings that you're having Mm -hmm. that uh hold on a second like yeah say all the nice things you want about god but this story is like that's not good enough right uh i think we we have to like give ourselves permission to say that and not try to wash it away or brush it out of our minds Mm -hmm. to say that uh that I actually want a better God than this <laughs> that doesn't have favorites. Right. Um, and I, I think that's fair. The favoritism, though, I think uh, the yes, way second that... second-born. Go ahead and tell me about yeah, favoritism. Yeah, second-born. Here we go. <laughs> well, what I remember is we used to accuse, accuse my parents of having favorites. And what my mom would always say is, yes, we do have favorites. Whoever is sick or sad, that one's our favorite that day. Oh. Man, that's good. Uh, which was never satisfying. But <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a little bit of what the Bible tells us about God. Is that uh, God seems to go for the one who's not in the perfect position. Not performing performing perfectly. Or, um, or here, like I really think it's about birth order. Because in the ancient world, birth order is such a huge deal. So much is determined by... If you're the firstborn, you you get the greatest inheritance, in many cases, the full inheritance. And then the others kind of get scraps. Right. But God actually goes to the one who has nothing or gets nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the but this story actually puts the two together. Abel's offering is better. And so he does look better than Cain. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, he's the second born. And so he's entitled to less than Cain is. So we actually get both of those things happening at the same time. So God is both choosing the better offering and choosing the lesser son. Uh, Both of which I think are things that the Bible wants to say are true about God. That God, uh, God expects our best, wants our best. And I have other thoughts about that. So we're doing rabbit holes on rabbit holes. But I think the part of the rationale for giving God your best is that if, if God, if you give God your best, then you're going to not have the best. Right. And you're going to have to depend on God to give you enough. Mm-hmm. So again, it's, it's a, it's a theological thing that's being said, give God your first fruits. Yes, because God deserves it, but also because it's a good thing to, to remain in the posture of needing God's help. Right. Uh, so um, the sense of sacrificial giving writ large, not just in Christianity, but across the board, I think that's part of what's behind it is we give God so much so that we never think we have enough of our own. And we always acknowledge that we need help from God. Um, 
so I think that's one major theme. And then this second born, this God's, uh, God's proclivity to choose the one that the world would not choose. Right. Can I counter that though? Please. First of all, yeah, the firstborn got everything mm-hmm. if they were boy. Right. So let's just acknowledge that. Oh, yeah. The firstborn <laughs> the, the, male. The firstborn male. I think too, like I, I look at the type of offering that was given and before I studied the story, you know, Abel's, Abel's offering has a lot of specifics, right? Like there's a lot of choice and, and there was thought put into his offering. Um, whereas Cain's, I'm not gonna say thoughtless, but we don't get not, the same we details. We don't get that. Yeah. Um, whereas before it was always just like, well, God didn't like fruits and vegetables. That was like my, my <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> I'm like, even God prefers meat. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know that's different. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that there's something about um, thoughtless giving versus thoughtful giving. Sure. Um, and what do you think that says about like today when we make offerings or we make sacrifices? Like, do you think that it's very easy to just like thoughtlessly give? In some ways, yes. I think... Uh... This is a little provocative, but I heard somebody say, like, at the end of the day, um, <laughs> I, the, the pastor shouldn't be saying this because it's going to sound coercive. But Do you want to write it down anyway. and then I'll read it? No. <laughs> uh, at, at the end of the day, what you put in the offering plate is what you think about God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way Jesus says that is, like, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm-hmm. Um, in a different way of saying it is, like, to, to see what you value or what you're scared of. Right. Look at your bank statement. Right. Uh, and that's an invitation to reflection. It, it, it needn't be heard as a word of judgment, but I but I also think it's true. Right. Because that could very easily be twisted. Because I have heard people say from the pulpit, like, the more you give, the more you love God. Like, like right. literally, have like, I heard them say that. Like, right. it's a reflection of how much you love God. And, like, if you're not giving. Which is I just was, coercion. The the part of it that I think is fruitful, though, is it invites us to see what we dedicate our life to is it's inevitably theological. Right. It's inevitably based on where we think our life comes from mm-hmm. and, um, and what we think is worthy of investment. Mm-hmm. So, like, a family vacation is worthy of investment because you love your family. Right. Like, so that I'm, I, I intend to, like, bless that kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And... But I think part of the invitation is uh, how you use your resources is inevitably theological. Therefore, maybe it's a way to ponder when you're doing your family budget. Like, okay, based on the love of God, mm-hmm. this is how we want to use our resources. Right. To actually give yourself permission to let that be a part of what you're doing. Also, like, based on the generosity of God. Based mm-hmm. on God's promises, this is how we want to use our resources. Because... Uh, I think a lot of money that we spent, especially spend, especially our generation in this economy, uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of what we spend is uh, based on what we're afraid of. Uh, like, I think yeah. we're all pretty anxious about like not having enough in the end. Uh, right. And... Which is why I have a membership to a big warehouse <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> store. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's like a stock up up. And, uh, and I, and I, I'm not trying to get anybody to listen to this and make terrible financial choices. I'm just inviting folks to see, um, those kinds of choices as also included in the life of faith. Well, and I think that it's less about, um, the stuff, especially mm-hmm. with Cain and Abel and, you know, kind of speaking more on, cause I'm not a pastor, so I can't say it, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's about your time, right? Sure. Abel, yeah, Abel gave the firstlings and he gave the fat portion and he gave all this. But Abel took the time to go into his flock and select what he was going to give to God. Yeah. Cain, we don't know if he did or not, but it's not indicated, right? It's like a matter of time. And yeah. I think like how you spend your time is also a sacrifice to God, an offering, to yeah, God. I, I didn't, I had no idea that we'd get into this today. So, uh, <laughs> we can cut it if we need no, to. No, no, I don't think we need <laughs> to cut it. I think just the thing that I want to make clear is that, um, that at no point, I think in the Bible, 
is the sacrifice we make actually so that we will win the favor of God. No. It is because God has favored us yes. that we make this gift or make this sacrifice. So it's always a response to what God has done. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so when you're doing your family budget or figuring out uh, whether to go to a work meeting or stay home for dinner or something like that, it is not, uh, ideally, it's not, if I do this, then God will be more proud of me. Right. Or if I do this, then my family will love me more. Mm-hmm. It's, it's actually based on what I know about God, what I know about love. That informs my decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not, it, it can't be about earning. No. Because uh, that's just a road to despair. And it's, and it's just not the God that we've been given. Right. We've been given a different kind of God who, um, who clearly, from last time's story and from this story, uh, is not really concerned about whether you deserve the love of God, because mm-hmm. uh, nobody does. No. Uh, but but God, nevertheless, provides, preserves life, gives. Right. Yeah. And and we talked about this also in the episode of how I, there was something I liked what you said is like maybe if Cain had just given God a little more time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe he would have gotten the favor. That's right? right. Or and and once again, God didn't out. I think the picture on my Sunday school wall, <laughs> Sunday school wall, was wrong. God didn't outright reject Cain. That's right. He didn't say get out of here. Like yeah. you know what I mean? I don't. And that's like why this in the song it was like get out of here. in the song I added my own interpretation and says like God liked Cain's gift too, just not as much. Right. And next week could have been different, you know, right. uh, and, but we don't, we don't get to see more of that because of the choice that Cain made. Right. What do you think Cain should have done instead? Uh, well, so you and I texted about this a little bit. Like, it's interesting to me that Cain feels rejected at some level by God, um, but doesn't actually take that up with God. Right. Uh, instead, Cain kills his brother, but his quarrel I think was actually with God. Mm-hmm. And I think we would do well to try to notice when that's the case and actually have enough faith to yell at God. Right. And to accuse God of not being a good enough God. Uh, the Psalms give us this. Like we, uh, we, we get permission in the scriptures uh, to accuse God of not creating a good enough creation or not being a good enough God. And I think that that, um, that that's actually an offering that God will regard Mm -hmm. that our honesty, like our bare honesty is certainly far more preferable to God than murdering our neighbor. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, that, but it's, but it takes, I think a lot of faith to cope with our problems by complaining directly to God. Mm -hmm. Uh, and nevertheless, I think that that's part of the life of the faith and part of what the Bible gives us permission to do yeah, is to say uh, that wasn't fair. And I think there's a lot of freedom in that. Um, You know, especially if you are someone who's raised to like fear God and not fear as in respect, but just like be afraid of God and And not want to offend. Exactly. Um, I will never forget. There was something you told me um, a few months ago. uh, My dad had a really bad health scare and you just happened to walk by me when I got off that phone call. (laughs) And, um, I was very sad and confused and angry. And I, I would, I'm, I can admit now I was quarreling with God at that point of just like, I don't get this yeah, and this makes no sense. And I'm mad. Like I'm sad, but I'm mad. Yeah. And there are no kids in the car. So you could say like, what the fuck? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I got, and I remember you because I was like, I, I looked at you and I was like, what do I pray? What do I say? I don't want to talk to God right now because I'm mad and yeah. I just want to cuss him out. Like, I, I'm so mad. And you said to me, like, every tear, every angry thought, every WTF is a prayer. Mm-hmm. And God's going to hear that. And that's okay. And I took that to heart. Um, and I also told my mom, who was also dealing with it a lot harder than I was. Yeah. And... Um, I remember I, I said that to my, I, I, I took that, I guess, permission mm-hmm. and it was almost like I felt God say back to me, like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. And you're going to have to trust me on this. And I understand that you're going to be angry because I made you to be that way. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And I made you to learn from this. Just like God goes to Cain and says, how you're feeling right now, check it. Right. And it's okay. Right? Like, but just be careful. I, I was at a fork in the road, I guess, in my faith at that time of, do I put my trust in God? That And, and my dad pulled through, fortunately. Um, but do I put my trust in God in this moment? Or do I just get angry and take it out on everybody? Yeah. <laughs> do I quit my job at the church and walk away from my faith and everything? And and I know that's an extreme example, but I think Cain also got to that fork of, do I put my trust in God? Do I talk to him about this? Do I fix my own heart um, and learn from my brother? Maybe talk to my parents who have seen you and walked with you face to face. Mm-hmm. Or do I take matters into my own hands? Yeah. And do I let my anger take control? Yeah. And yeah, there's just there's just freedom in that. Yeah. And I think that people listening to that, like, it's okay to have that kind of freedom. Yeah. It's actually faithful. Yeah. Uh if if God's not real, then there's no there's no sense in arguing with God. Right. Because God is real and personal. Mm-hmm. If you don't take it up with God, then uh, then you're not actually addressing the problem, right? Um, and I think that that made it it made things a lot easier because it did remind me that God was real, right? That somebody else was in control, right? Which I have a really hard time with already, but <laughs> yeah, sure. I think uh, right, and I think part of the reality of this story uh, and just real life is like. The mark of Cain is not a good luck charm. No. Uh, and like the goodness of God does not mean you're, you get out of all the bad things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it doesn't even mean that everything gets to make sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the mark of Cain is a promise. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I liken the mark of Cain to the sign of the cross. Uh, I really liked that. It's, a, it's not a good luck charm. Uh, it's, it's a promise. That even death, even suffering, even injustice will not prevent me from being able to get to you. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason why I do that to my kids when they're falling asleep or they're asleep is for myself to have that reminder that um, that they belong to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think part of it, uh, like raising Christian kids, is also, um, I think in our culture, parents are supposed to make sure their kids are safe and happy. Yes. And those are not Christian virtues. Uh, Christian virtues include courage, hope in the midst of suffering, um, faithfulness to God, Mm -hmm. and sacrificial love of the neighbor. Um, The the, the faith that I was baptized in tells me that's what you want for your kids. That's what that's what God has given. That's where the adventure is. Right. Um, If you all you want them to do is, is be safe and happy then anytime they're not happy, it's going to be a theological crisis for you. Yes. <laughs> or, or anytime, or when you realize they're not safe, um, you will have nothing but hopelessness. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, what we've been told is that uh, what God promises us is not utter safety. It is utter communion or utter love or a forever promise that there is nothing that can separate you from my love. Uh, and so, and for like, when we baptize our kids, um, we're not giving them safety and happiness. We're actually giving them a calling right? that they're actually part of this church. That's supposed to tell the world what God is like. Mm -hmm. And historically that's often meant suffering. And so, um, in my heart of hearts, I want my children to have a full life. And I know now that that doesn't mean safety and happiness all the time. That's rough though. Yeah. That is a that is a rough like thing to have to just kind of accept. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's I think it's more and more countercultural. Yeah. I mean, uh like you can imagine parents whose children were being sent off to like World War II. Mm-hmm. Some parents were like, Absolutely not. You're I'm gonna make sure you get out of that, uh, mm-hmm. to protect your safety and happiness. You can imagine other parents that were like, I do not want you to die and please go kill those Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> like, because it's the right thing to do. Right. Uh, so, um, 
And I think that Christian parenting is actually more like the latter. Um, that be of good courage and go and do the hard thing. Mm -hmm. uh, not because it's easy, not because it's profitable, but because it's what God is like. Right. Yeah, I, I talked to a mom recently and she was talking about how her kids, you know, she was raising them with like Christian values and stuff like that. And um, one of her her kids was kind of arguing they, they couldn't do something. And um, just because the mom didn't feel comfortable with it. And she was like, you know, that just doesn't really align with our values. And the kid was like, but everybody does. And I'm being left out. And she was like, well, that's what being, that's the part of being a Christian, right? It's yeah. like, you're going to be left out sometimes yeah. and that's okay. Like, it, make, yeah. it makes us different. It makes us different. Can I offer a confession? Oh, please. Uh, this is a story about siblings, um, but I also think the animosity we've seen between Cain and Abel um, can happen in any relationship. Oh, yeah. And I want to confess because this is kind of a parenting podcast that I think... Um, I am the cane to my children's Abel sometimes when I've had a bad day. I'm not managing my own stuff. And that means I don't have any patience and I take it out on them. 100%. This is a safe space. <laughs> and I'm sure any parent listening to this is going to be like, oh, right on. I'm yeah. not a terrible person. <laughs> yeah. And so um, part of that is like, I think it's helping me reflect on misdirected rage. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and maybe can I, maybe it's not like God who I'm mad at at that moment. Maybe it's, you know, this other thing, mm -hmm. but can I actually direct that in the right direction rather than diverting it so that someone else suffers? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, that feels very close to like the heart of the human condition mm -hmm. is <laughs> I'm upset. Somebody else needs to feel it. Have you ever been, um, frustrated with your kids trying to get them out the door and you've reached You've reached peak frustration, and then you can't find your keys. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my problem. Uh, that, it never fails. It never fails that when I have been asked 100,000 questions, and we still don't have shoes on, <laughs> that I can't find my keys or my phone. <laughs> and oh. my anger is at my keys, but unfortunately, my youngest asks me one more time <laughs> yeah. if she can have a piece of candy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's like, oh, no, I'm mad at the keys. <laughs> but I'm going to talk really harshly to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So overall, I think that's, yeah. <laughs> and overall, I think like that's, a, um, that's part of what I hope folks can catch from our discussions of the Bible is that, uh, one of the primary things we want to ask is what does this say about God? Another is how does this give us a mirror yeah. to show us ourselves, uh, to reflect on, to notice our own weak spots, to notice our, our own tendencies and then, um, and then kind of fall into eternal love. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's actually the thing that can change our hearts. Yeah. Um, it's, we can't do it ourselves, but uh, but receiving that grace actually can transform. So I have a question. Yeah. How how would you talk to your kids about this? No, I was going to ask you that question. No. Nope. Uh, sorry. Right. <laughs> I, the, the outline was covered. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> your, well, okay, your oldest already knows the, the story. Yeah. She's got to figure it figured out. But <laughs> the other two, how are you going to talk to your kids about this? Um. I've thought about this too. Cause like we, I wrote this song with Hannah and it was kind of in the air. I think part of my objective in giving these stories to my kids is just so that it's part of their early childhood and then they have their whole lives to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't want anybody to think that like we sit down and talk about the Bible. Uh, like <laughs> in your family, you probably actually do, but I'm just not that holy. Uh, <laughs> we don't all the time. Um, but like part of what participating in life of the church means that it raises the chances that sometimes we end up talking about God. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that uh, it, it could help us navigate sibling conflict. Uh, um, even if it's just to say like, okay, like probably not in the midst of the conflict, but there's a thing that therapists and counselors have taught me that um, you're not going to be able to address the conflict while it's happening. But if you can talk about it later mm -hmm. and kind of like do an autopsy on what just happened there, that uh, that's when you can kind of raise the chances that it goes different another time. So maybe after the conflict, when we can say, hey, I want to talk about what we went through yesterday or last night. Um, when I do this, it's usually to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but, but I wonder if these stories give us a chance to say, uh, that thing that happened yesterday, 
who was Cain and who was Abel in the story? Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, who was the one offended? And what do they do about it? Uh, who who made you jealous? Did I make you jealous? Uh, did you think that I love that person more than you? Like, maybe it gives us uh, an interpretive tool in actually reflecting on how things go. But I also, I don't assume that reflection on those kinds of things is in the cards for every family, certainly right. not for every conflict. But I think part of what having these stories gives us is somebody else's life through which to reflect on our own. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it's somebody else's family through which to reflect on how our own family works. Right. Yeah. And you have to be careful because, you know, with Cain, do he does receive a little bit of redemption at the end. I don't mm-hmm. want my kid getting this idea of like, well, if I hurt my sibling, it's fine. <laughs> God's going to mark me. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. At that point, you say like, yeah, God will have mercy on you, but I'm your father. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, I think for me, I have one child who believes that everything her sister does is a personal attack. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's just that sister could walk in the room wrong or she could sing a little too loud or because the one that is not personally attacking, the the one that's normally offending um, is very, she's in her own world. Mm-hmm. And she runs into all the things. You know what I mean? So if she bumps her sister or something, that sister just takes it as a personal attack. Like, and will get very upset yeah. about things all the time. And it's like, I have to remind her, she literally did not mean that. Or she did it. Because, and sometimes she'll like yell at her sister. And then her sister will be like, I didn't even know you were in the room. You yeah, know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think just that whole... It's not necessarily talking to my kids about, but just remembering how God was very quick to see something and say something and give that child the opportunity to reflect. Sure. You know what I mean? Give the child or give Kane the opportunity, but give my child of just like, let's think about this. Yeah. Did she mean it? And is your reaction, is your reaction justified? Even if she did mean it, right? Even if Abel did go like, huh, look at Kane's offering. I'm going to intentionally make mine better. Right? Yeah. Is your response justified? Mm-hmm. And there will be a consequence to this action right. <laughs> if you decide to pursue the matter. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's kind of how I would probably approach it with my kids. Yeah. And and just talking about it, I, I think don't hide this story from your kids. It did come up in Children's Church recently. Yeah. Um, we were talking about just different people of the Bible And somehow Abel came up and the kids were like, I don't know who that guy is. And so I explained it. I was like, him and his brother got in a big fight. (laughs) But even I was kind of scared to start talking about fratricide. You know what I mean? Like, um, but I think at an appropriate age, you can talk to your, you know, you can always scale up the story. Um, But talk to your kids about it. And we, we said this on the last episode, ask your kids what are you getting out of this? Yeah, what do you notice? Yeah, and what questions do you have? And then if you don't have an answer, you taught me this, Drew. If you don't have an answer, just keep asking them what they think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. I also, like, I, I want to name that I identify with Keen in the story. Welcome. And, Welcome to the firstborn side. Uh, I also want to name that there are a whole lot of people in the world that identify with Abel. Mm. And uh, that identify not just as sinners, but as the unjustly sinned against. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's worth pointing out that uh, the reason God shows back up and starts talking to Cain is because God says, your your brother's blood cried out to me from the ground. That what got God's attention in the first place was Abel's suffering. And that God sees that too. Mm. Uh, and, and ultimately in the, in the Christian tradition, part of what we say about Jesus is that Jesus is able raised from the dead in order to reconcile his relationship with Cain. I like that. That, um, that Jesus takes on, Jesus shows up as God identifying completely with the victim in the story. Yeah. And miraculously, when that victim comes back to life, it is not um, to come at and be fair. Right. It's actually to have mercy on 
the one who killed you. Um, so, which I'm not actually saying that people who are sinned against or identify as victims need to have mercy on their abusers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's God's job. Um, but it is God's job. Mm -hmm. And uh, and anytime we are in the midst of suffering, particularly unjust suffering, um, part of what the Bible tells us is that that's the voice that God is actually listening for. That's um, that's what gets God's attention is when God's children are suffering. Um, and I hope that's good news. Uh, again, I generally identify as the villain in the stories <laughs> and, not, and not the victim. Um, but I've also learned that um, that can mean that the sinned against in the crowd uh, um, feel left out or unseen. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Right. Um, the truth is that God's paying attention to you first. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would just offer that. Oh, the one other thing I'll say for families is like I talked about, we both talked about like kind of intervention methods. Like <laughs> if things are going bad. How do we intervene? And I think it's important to kind of disabuse people of the thought that if it goes badly once, all you can do is sprinkle a little Bible on it and it'll get better next time. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> that never works. Uh, <laughs> can I say something real quick? Yeah. My kids, uh, they listen to the Adam and Eve episode. Uh -huh. And about two days later, they broke something mm. and they both raced up the stairs to blame the other one before before the other one can get to the top of the stairs. And so they raced up the stairs. <laughs> They start blaming each other. And my husband started singing the Adam and Eve song. And let me tell you how well that went. It didn't. Yeah. It didn't go well. <laughs> they both started crying. They both went to their rooms. And I got to sleep for an extra 30 minutes. So it went well for me. <laughs> but it was not a teachable moment. <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, that's perfect. That's a, like, that's a parable in, itself, in and of itself. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not it's not going to fix everything. Mm. Uh, that's that's not the idea. It can explain stuff, but um, in the fa in in a family, some of these kind of deep seated things uh, take decades and decades. Yeah, to work themselves out, and in some families, it never happens. Mm -hmm. uh, in biblical history, it takes thousands of years uh, for some of this stuff to get worked out. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same at the same time the the mercy of God um, is not something we have to wait on. No. It's offered the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, and one day creation will catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we see it happen in little glimpses here or there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but God's mercy is is here for Cain before he's ready to reconcile with his brother. Mm -hmm. um, even now. Um, and... So uh, so I, I keep on just trying to take a little pressure off. Yeah. And that you, you, some families will never reconcile. Right. That's okay. Right. Right. God some of us, some, some of us had to find a different family. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that's okay. I mean, Jesus will later say, uh, who are my mothers and my brothers? The people that do the will of God. Right. That's who I will be associating with myself, my, myself with. Right. Um, and that there's a lot of beauty in that. Yeah. So I think before we go, let's just reiterate, we are not saying that you have to give all of your money away. That's right. <laughs> we are not saying that you have to uh, lose your job to eat dinner with your family. That's right. <laughs> we're not saying that. That's right. And we're also not saying that you need to make peace with everybody in your family today, tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And that if you get frustrated with your kids, it's okay because you love them. Yeah. You love them and that's okay. Yeah. You just always try to be a little better the next time. Yeah. Give it. Cain should have waited to make that second offering. Yeah. And thanks be to God, we have an opportunity to always make a second offering. Amen. Yes. All right. Well, if you have any questions or comments or I wonder questions, um, we do have an Instagram page. You can find us at mini evangelism on Instagram. You can feel free to send us a message, um, drop us a like, make sure you follow us. Um, and if you have any other questions or comments or corrections, um, 
I'm sure Drew said something wrong at one point. Yeah. Uh, you can Apparently, <laughs> you're just listing all the things that I said <laughs> wrong. So, yeah. You can email minivangelism at gmail.com and we will get back to you in as timely a manner as we are able to. But both of us are not great on the email responses. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. I don't respond to emails. <laughs> but we will respond to you. So, thank you so much and we look forward to hearing from you next time. Bye. Bye. Mini Vangelism and the Driver's Seat are hosted by Anna Burrell and Drew Colby. Theme song written by David Burrell and produced by Evan Setzer. The theme song was performed by David Burrell, Drew Colby, and Evan Setzer. Podcast, sound design, and editing done by David Burrell. Mini Vangelism and the Driver's Seat are a ministry of Grace United Methodist Church in Manassas, Virginia. For more information, check out umcgrace.org.